um, Russia is an existential threat um, to all of us because of their nuclear weapons and because of the attitude and their sense of entitlement and the arrogance of the of the Kremlin. So they're, they're, they're a threat to all of us. So what Ukraine is doing, actually, they are the, uh, they're defending Europe. They're defending all of us. Um, you know, just the other day, the deputy head of the CIA and said that President Xi had told his guys, I need us to be ready to attack Taiwan by 2027. That's five years from now. That's, that's when they think they'll be ready. That doesn't mean it's going to happen, but getting themselves organized. And now, you know, if, if our industrial base and, and our Department of Defense is working now to, to rebuild uh, the, the munitions stockpiles and capabilities and, and strengthen the cohesion of the alliance, but that's happening now instead of, you know, three years from now when it's like, oh, hell, you know, the Chinese are a real threat. So I, I understand why some people are concerned that we can't give away all the high Mars, we can't use all the, all the rockets up. But in my view, this is, this is a positive. Hello, everyone. You are listening and watching Rashkin Report, and my name is Yuri Rashkin. And I'm very excited that you're here with us today because uh, we're really here presenting a very unique opportunity to hear a very important voice uh, for people who may not be able to hear it directly, hear it in uh, echoes, so to say, or short outbursts of Twitter. And here we have with us the, the former commanding general of U.S. Army Europe, now the senior advisor to Human Rights First, a nonprofit, nonpartisan international human rights organization based in New York, Washington, D.C., and Los Angeles, and a NATO senior mentor for logistics who consults for several companies in Europe and uh, author of book Future War and the Defense of Europe, Lieutenant General of Retired Ben Hodges. Welcome. All right. Thank you very much. It's good to be here with you. This is a very unique uh, situation because, again, I am so excited to be able to share with you questions that we've received from uh, people who are very much interested in what you have to say, who live in Ukraine and in Russia. And, and boy, you are a popular guy. Congratulations. So <laughs> I, will <laughs> I will start with this. Uh, in your recent article in Daily Telegraph, you said that the West should be ready for the breakup of Russia. Uh, the question is, how exactly the West should prepare itself to the possible disintegration of Russia? What are concrete measures? Well, that, that's an important question. Uh, obviously, what the first thing that most people think about when they contemplate this possibility is uh, all the thousands of nuclear weapons that are out there, as well as the other uh, huge amounts of uh, armaments. Um, who, who would control them? Where, where would they go? So I think the relevant authorities will be thinking about how might they do that. And, and look, I do want to emphasize I'm not advocating or trying to accelerate the breakup of the Russian Federation, but I think we need to be clear uh, about the possibility because we were not prepared for the collapse of the Soviet Union 30 years ago. That happened pretty fast. And I think we could be smarter so that whatever it looks like three, four, five years from now, young people have the best opportunity uh, for education and, and uh, restoring their lives that we can minimize the amount of violence that might occur as uh, places like Chechnya, for example, may decide that this is their opportunity. We wanna minimize that, that sort of violence. And of course, um, you've got massive energy infrastructure. So Russia, the, the nation of Russia will still control and should control most of that, I would imagine. So just thinking through the implications. And of course, Russia is on, uh, every international agency there is, what, what would be the implications um, for, for that? Are you thinking almost in terms of humanitarian catastrophe that may follow? Well, I think that um, the, the breakup, it, if it happens, if it happens, I could imagine certain, certain areas, um, ethnic, ethnic regions, for example, further away from Moscow and St. Petersburg that see opportunity. And so there could be uh, violence associated with that, retribution, I, I don't know. But also, 
uh, I could imagine a lot of refugees, uh, people um, trying to move away from from what might happen. It doesn't have to be. I don't want it to be that, but I'm just I'm just trying to think through. Um, would we be prepared? And I know right now most people can't even imagine that that's a possibility. But you know, I was I was surprised when the Soviet Union collapsed. Also, what about the diplomatic uh, consequences, such as uh, whether all the let's say newly formed states should be or shouldn't be recognized by the international community? Is that an important uh, part of it? That's an excellent uh, question. You remember, um, and at the breakup of the former Yugoslav Republic, Yugoslavia, I mean, there was a lot of debate, there still is, um, as well as a lot of violence about whether or not to recognize uh, the former, the breakup of the former Yugoslavia, where each of those states, Croatia, Serbia, Bosnia, Kosovo, uh, and Slovenia, and so on, were they whether or not to recognize them. So this this would be one of the implications is what how, how does that happen? And, and of course there will be different um, different views on this. Does the national um, defense of the United States have a position on whether it is better for the United States or the West to have Russia remain as one entity or to be several entities? How do, how do we look at this? Yeah, I, you know what? I don't know. Um, I, I'm sure that the government position would be that this is up to the people of the Russian Federation of, of Russia to, to make those kind of decisions. I, I can't imagine any official ever saying, you know, we we want it to happen or something like that. What we want, what we want, of course, is uh, peace. We want the Russians to live within their own borders, their own borders, um, and allow people on their periphery to make their own sovereign decisions. So I, I think that's what, that is the government's position now and, and it would continue um, to be that way. But I think I would imagine people that are responsible for thinking about possibilities would of course want this to be, any transition to be as peaceful um, as possible. Do you have any thoughts on to how many chunks Russia could break into? Do you think it's going to be a couple of big ones or lots of little ones? And could this be a way out of sanctions for some of these territories? Like if Tatarstan is no longer part of Russia, are they under sanctions? Uh -huh, that's a, another excellent question. Um, I would imagine that there will be uh, regional powers that are that are looking at possibilities um, and, and certainly, if somebody uh, in one of these regions, a, a leader in one of these regions thought that they might be able to uh, to get out from underneath sanctions, uh, for sure, I, I would imagine that they would uh, apply for that. Um, but that that's I have to admit that that is beyond my sure. expertise. <laughs> um, any thoughts on how much time you think is left for before Russian Empire collapses and how could Putin end up? Well, you know, the president of the Russian Federation just finished a terrible week. Um, I mean, the first guards tank army was destroyed. Um, he lost a, a vote in the UN General Assembly where Russia was hoping to block President Zelensky from appearing through video to express the UN General Assembly. You know, and your listeners probably know that um, one of the rules is for a head of government to address the General Assembly each year, they have to be there in person. Obviously, that's difficult for President Zelensky. So they asked if they could do it by video. Russia, the Russian, uh, the Kremlin said, call for a vote on this. And the vote was 101 to 7 in favor of allowing President Zelensky to address the UN General Assembly by video. That's a, that's a crushing uh, defeat uh, in, in terms of UN votes. And interestingly, India was on the, the hundred was one of the 101 countries voting to allow it, and China abstained. Uh, then you have the um, what ha can only be described as humiliation uh, of the president of the Russian Federation being stood up or having to wait on four other heads of state during the meetings in uh, Samarkand here this past week. Then you've got the the uh, viral video of the head of the Wagner group recruiting convicts to come fight in Ukraine. 
and then the, and then the same day or the next day you've got the uh, exhumation of over 400 Ukrainians who had been murdered and buried there near Isium. All of these things coming out this week, and and uh, even for so an outsider like me, I can see the uh, anger uh, in the Russian TV in Moscow, the uh, recriminations about who's responsible for this disaster or whether or not it's a disaster. Yeah. And then you've got the, the Ferris wheel in Moscow breaks down on the first day. I mean, almost a metaphor for, um, for what's happening to uh, the regime right now. Well, let's uh, keep things moving, uh, shift to the second part, a big area that I'd like to get your take on, uh, General Hodges. What do you think about President Biden's approach to global politics? Do you think it was possible to do anything to avoid the war? Um, the, the continuation, the big open war that we saw starting on February 24th? So, uh, yes, there was. Um, if the United States and our allies had acted more forcefully after Russia invaded Georgia in 2008, if we had uh, lived up to the threat of a red line with Syria using chemical weapons, uh, and if we had reacted more forcefully after Russia's invasion of Crimea in 2014, but the West did basically nothing. I mean, nothing of any real consequence after those three uh, things. And so um, I think that the Kremlin probably assumed uh, that we would not uh, act again, that they would be able to do what they wanted and uh, and we would we would not try to stop it or not in any meaningful way. So So yes, in that regard, we could have done more. Um, but the decision of Russian force of the Kremlin to have Russian forces uh, start this uh, the latest offensive on 24 February, of course, that's 100 percent the responsibility of the Kremlin. Yuri, I, I think I think the Kremlin made four strategic miscalculations. Number one, uh, they were sure that they had force advantage, superior forces that they would be able to roll over Ukrainian forces, almost like uh, in Budapest or Prague back during the Cold War. I think that was really the expectation. So there was a, uh, and, and by the way, I also overestimated the capabilities of Russian Federation forces. I thought they would do uh, much better. I was sure the Ukrainians would do well, but I did not do know that the Russian forces would be as unprepared for this war as they demonstrated. But that was the first big miscalculation. The second miscalculation is related to what you just asked. Um, the Kremlin was sure that they would be able to isolate Ukraine from any kind of third party support, that we would not actually, that the Germans would not turn off the gas uh, or disconnect from Nord Stream 2 or Nord Stream 1, uh, that we would not be able to get the sanctions in place and that, that we would not really stick together the way we have and deliver everything that's been delivered. So that was a, a miscalculation in part because we had demonstrated in the past that we wouldn't do that. The third miscalculation, of course, was that the Kremlin thought that they would get a two for, two for one, that not only would they destroy Ukraine as, as a country and even the idea of Ukraine as a country, um, that they would um, break up NATO that the alliance would not be able to stick together, that countries would start peeling off like we're not a part of this. And then the final miscalculation was that uh, the gain would be worth any pain. They didn't really believe that we would um, uh, be able to impose the sanctions that we did um, and that you know them getting Ukraine, it'd be worth whatever, whatever happened. So four big miscalculations, at least two of those four are because in the past, we had not stood up uh, firmly uh, and made it clear that Russian aggression would not be tolerated. Is there a point at which you feel the democratic world would decide to get involved to defend the civilians? Is there, who are, who are suffering? Uh, this is a crisis on many levels. How long can uh, we, we watch uh, and, and, uh, and not do more than we are? Yeah, that, that is such an important point. Um, while I think the, the administration has done a very good job on most aspects of this war, um, 
I think that the administration has exaggerated or overestimated the, uh, the risk of the Kremlin escalating. And so because of that, they have limited themselves from doing certain things that I think would have uh, would not only bring about a quicker conclusion to this war, which the Ukrainians are eventually going to win, uh, but we could be doing things that would provide better protection for uh, innocent people that are that are being slaughtered in cities. Longer range weapons, aircraft um, capabilities, more missile defense. Instead, we we have kind of stair stepped. Uh, from whether or not to give Stinger, if you can believe that, six months ago, to now, um, you know, a, a longer range uh, missile, which would, would uh, with a 300 kilometer range ATACMS missile, you could fire from Odessa and hit Sevastopol. Um, that, that would have real impact. Uh, but instead, we haven't done that. So, um, and I also, I wish the president had not said no. I mean, you, you will recall, he said, whatever happens, no U.S. boots on the ground. Why, why would you say that? I mean, even if, that, even if you never intended to, why would you telegraph that from the beginning that we're never going to put U.S. troops in there? I mean, what, what they have done is, you, is typically or consistently tell the Kremlin what we won't do. And the, the emphasis on we, just, we defend every square inch of NATO basically says, but nothing else. And, and so I, I think that has emboldened uh, the Kremlin somewhat. Well, I, I will say here that you're listening to Washington Rashkin Report. My name is Yuri Rashkin. My guest is General Ben Hodges. And we're discussing here the situation in Ukraine, situation in the United States. Uh, should we get that far? And it's interesting because I asked for questions. We got lots of questions. They're all in Russian because that's, that's usually how this uh, channel conducts itself and uh, first of all people just wanted to express their gratitude and and thankfulness uh, to for all the help that ukraine has received so far and to the american military and to everybody that helped it really is important to get across but then the next question is can you ask for tomahawks can you ask for like more weapons um, there's soviet weapons at uh, some uh, storage place in kalbasna uh, that is in uh, Moldova. There is uh, different ways of just arming, 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 arming Ukrainian um, army. How do you see this? And also you signed the uh, letter of uh, 20 so-called or one of the undis uh, undis signatories. And uh, there was a question of how do you feel, what kind of impact that did? So uh, just how much more and how much faster can we arm Ukraine, do you feel? So, um... Real quickly, this gigantic storage ammunition storage site in Moldova, I think it's actually in Transnistria, um, almost none of that ammunition is usable. They're, they are very worried there uh, uh, in Moldova, by the way, that if that thing goes up, it'll be worse than this uh, grain uh, explosion in, in Beirut because this ammunition is so old and it's not properly stored and it, it's, a, it's a disaster waiting to happen. So there's no ammunition there um, that would be usable, uh, I don't believe, for Ukrainian forces. But uh, look, the, the, the way this should be working is that uh, the administration, along with our allies, should be saying, we are committed to Ukraine winning. Not this, uh, we want Russia to lose, or we want Ukraine integrity, territorial integrity. They need to say, win. We want Ukraine to win. And win means uh, defeating Russian forces on the battlefield, in the Black Sea, in the air, and push regaining all of Ukraine's sovereign territory. Make that very clear. That's the outcome. And therefore, we are going to do whatever it takes to ensure that Ukraine is able to do that, because this is about so much more than just Ukraine. Now, when it comes to asking for weapons, um, I, I mean, I see a thousand uh, notes and twi tweets and articles every day about why don't we get this leopard? Why can't we get this tomahawk? Why, why don't we get these A-10s and on and on and on? And really, the, the most effective way to do this is talk about capabilities. What are the capabilities needed to achieve the win? And so when you talk about capabilities, you talk about long-range precision fires, endless ammunition, ballistic missile defense to protect 
civilians and infrastructure uh, and the ability to make sure that no Russian ship gets close enough to uh, harm any Ukrainians. So talk about capabilities. And then uh, reporters should say, whenever the White House or, or Berlin or London or anybody says, hey, we, we're announcing another package of $2 billion worth of whatever. You say, thank you very much. The only metric that matters is what percentage does that represent of the requirement to win? I mean, you could you could put a, a dollar symbol or a euro symbol next to a number that somebody would have figured out, okay, in order to win, we've done the math, it's going to take this amount and so today we're happy to announce that we're at the 70% mark of all the agreed capabilities required for Ukraine to win. And now we're still working on that remaining 30%. That's otherwise, it, it frankly is not relevant to say another 2 billion because 2 billion compared to what, what's the requirement. That's, I'm sorry to go on about that, but it's, um, this is what logisticians do, by the way. The logisticians, my logies would say, sir, we delivered you know, 10,000 gallons of fuel. And I would say, well, that's great. I needed 50,000. So, you know, the big, a big number is not relevant unless you put it within the context of the requirement. That is an excellent point. Uh, could it be that the final number is just too high and, and we'd rather just spoon feed it to the public? And also what about American uh, national defense? Is this putting in jeopardy anything that to do with us? Actually, no, um, this, this helps us uh, for two reasons. Number one, um, Russia is an existential threat um, to all of us because of their nuclear weapons and because of the attitude and their sense of entitlement and the arrogance of the, of the Kremlin. So they're, they're, they're a threat to all of us. So what Ukraine is doing, actually, they are the, uh, they're defending Europe, they're defending all of us. And so it's in our interest that they are successful, that they win. So this this helps us. And so whether a, a, a high Mars rocket is fired by a Ukrainian crew or an American crew, it, it still achieves the effect that's needed. But this also helps us, uh, Yuri, because this has woken us up. You know, we there has been more artillery ammunition expended in the past six months than we spent in the last 20 years in Iraq and Afghanistan. So now yeah, yes, of course, we're pulling um, our own munitions and, and equipment out of storage here in Germany or back in the U.S. The U.K. is doing this. Other, other NATO countries are doing it. And so now we're having to wake up and say, wow, we, we, we got to produce more rockets. You know, and there's, there's, one, there's one place that makes the rocket for high marks. So, I mean, we've got to crank up industrial, uh, the industrial base again. This is why I think, by the way, that China is not real happy with the Kremlin, because the Chinese would have preferred that we were, were still kind of sleepily moving along. Um, you know, just the other day, the deputy head of the CIA and said that President Xi had told his guys, I need us to be ready to attack Taiwan by 2027. That's five years from now. That's, that's when they think they'll be ready. That doesn't mean it's going to happen, but getting themselves organized. And now... You know, if, if our industrial base and, and our Department of Defense is working now to, to rebuild uh, the, the munitions stockpiles and capabilities and, and strengthen the cohesion of the alliance, but that's happening now instead of, you know, three years from now when it's like, oh, hell, you know, the Chinese are a real threat. So I... I understand why some people are concerned that oh, we can't give away all the high Mars, we can't use all the all the rockets up. But in my view, this is this is a positive. Um, existential threat is, is a pretty big uh, term we, as compared, as opposed to a, a state a sponsor of terrorism, which is another question. Like, what is the real reason that uh, the Russia still hasn't been declared a state sponsor of terrorism? But uh, national existential threat makes me think of China. Um, is this, are we making an example of Russia or is there so that China would save us money or, um, and really to what extent is China involved in controlling Kremlin? Because, you know, and people in Russia always look for some hidden hand behind the curtain that controls everything. Is Chairman uh, Xi the, the, somebody who is pulling Kremlin strings? How do you see that dynamic? Well, um, 
I think that uh, China is watching very closely whether or not the United States, with all of our allies, can stop Russia. Can working with Ukraine? Can we actually stop Russia? If we if we cannot uh, bear the economic pressure that that European countries in particular are feeling because of energy um, that used to come from Russia, if we can't stick together and and be and help Ukraine defeat Russia, then I don't think the Chinese will be too impressed with anything we say about Taiwan or the South China Sea. So there is a um, an element of strategic deterrence uh, that we that we should be thinking about as as one of the reasons why we're supporting uh, Ukraine and, and want Ukraine to be successful. That's one part of it. Um, as far as the relationship goes with China and Russia, uh, this is a, a very good question and that I can't answer fully, but it's clear to me that Ukraine. Uh, Russia is the junior partner in this relationship, and that President Xi is the one that um, has all the leverage. Um, I, I thought President Putin was a, um, put in his place a little bit this past week by the Chinese. I mean, um, I mean, when President Putin basically says, uh, "President Xi, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I understand your concerns with what we're doing." I mean, almost groveling. Uh, not not what you know not what we're used to hearing from the Kremlin, and um, I, I'm pretty sure. I, of course, I can't confirm this, but I'm pretty sure that while China is happy to get very low cost uh, gas and oil from Russia, they are not going to send a whole lot of material help to the Russians because they don't want to be sanctioned by the United States either. So. I don't, I don't, I don't think that uh, Russia can count on China for much at, at this point. Um, but they also, the Russians have got to be concerned because they cannot defend their entire border that they share with um, with China. And and, and the, I think the Chinese are probably thinking, hmm, we may have an opportunity to recover lost territory. So many questions, uh, so little time. So what about that state sponsor of terrorism, though? Do you think that at some point Secretary Blinken will think it's a good idea? Grant that it's not your department of expertise, but if you have any thoughts. So without a doubt, Russia is a terrorist. The Kremlin is a terrorist organization. They, there's no doubt about it. I mean, they use murder um, to uh, for leverage, uh, and they, they have used all sorts of tools, disinformation, um, energy, um, corruption in order to achieve their aims. I mean, this is what terrorist organizations do. They are completely outside the law, uh, international law and so many things. What um, I can only imagine that the United States is um, talking with uh, our allies. And I would say this, Secretary Blinken, I hope they're building a statue for him right now. He has done a masterful job of consulting with allies um, better than I've seen of any secretary in, in my professional life. Uh, usually we're talking at allies. Secretary Blinken has consulted with allies, as has our president. Um, I imagine that this is being discussed amongst, the, amongst the, the nations. Is that useful? I mean, it would feel good, but is it actually useful? And of course, there would be there's legal aspects of this that by the law would things would have to happen that may affect other countries or have unintended consequences. So, um, I that's that's all I could offer on this. Yes, of course it's a terrorist state, but the formal designation in the long run may not actually help. All right. So the no conversation will be complete without uh, touching on the threat that Russia and its nuclear arsenal uh, proposes. Uh, we're seeing that uh, Biden administration was doing uh, things to, you know, prevent uh, uh, from World War Three breaking out. But now Putin, you know, announced on a third day of uh, the war that uh, to put uh, nuclear arms on standby. And now he's not not using it, not using it. Maybe he'll do something terrible in Zaporozhye. But outside of that, are we overestimating the Russian nuclear threat? Maybe we should give Ukraine. Somebody wrote, well, maybe you should give Ukraine just a little bit, just in case of some nuclear capabilities. Uh, how do you see nuclear playing into this? 
So um, I think you you said it right that we have overestimated the the risk of the Kremlin using a tactical nuclear weapon. Now, of course, they have thousands of weapons. Of course, they do not care how many people might actually die, even of their own people. Uh, but I think uh, they realize that if they were to use a tactical nuclear weapon inside Ukraine, it would be impossible for the United States not to be involved, that the US would have to respond in some way uh, because China's watching, Iran is watching, North Korea is watching. And if the US did not respond to the use of a nuclear weapon by Russia, then we would have, I think, serious problems with those countries thinking that they could probably get away with using a nuclear weapon as well in some sort of limited way. So I think, um, and, and of course, we all saw President Biden on a 60 Minutes interview just uh, this weekend or the other night where um, he made, I thought he made it very, very clear that there will be consequences for Russia should they make the terrible miscalculation to use a weapon. Now, the response does not necessarily have to be a nuclear response, but I, I suspect that the Pentagon will have drawn up a list of options um, for the president covering the full range of possibilities. Uh, I would expect that the president would have discussed this with at least some of his uh, counterparts um, because there would be obviously concerns from UK, France, Germany, Poland, uh, Italy, and, and uh, other nations, particularly those that are closest to the region, Black Sea nations and Baltic Sea nations, um, and with President Zelensky. But I think that uh, the Kremlin knows this. They know that, just imagine uh, a devastating uh, strike on what's left of the Black Sea fleet. I mean, it'd be completely destroyed at very, very low risk to, to us. Um, that's, that's the kind of uh, effect that could be achieved. But there's various other things that, that could be done as well. So because the Kremlin knows this, and because, frankly, use a tactical nuclear weapon inside, um, inside uh, Ukraine does not really give them a meaningful battlefield advantage, I think it's unlikely. And and Putin is evil, but it, I don't think they're crazy. And I don't think that the people around him want to drive off the cliff um, you know, to deal with the, the results of, of what the, the aftermath would be. So that's why I think it's unlikely and that those nuclear weapons they have are actually more effective if they don't use them because we keep deterring ourselves because we're concerned about it. Uh, General, I know we have a kind of a time limit. But do you have time for a couple more questions or do you have to go? No, I, I, I can take a couple more. Great. How do you see the state of the Russian army at this point? And what do you anticipate Russian uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, their generals, to, to come up with next? Uh, and, and what is the risk for the Ukrainian army in this? Well, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm surprised that Minister Shoigu and General Gerasimov are still in their jobs. I mean, this has been a catastrophe for Russian forces. Um, as I said earlier, I completely overestimated um, what their capabilities were. I've, uh, I've learned a lot in the last six months. Um, you know, the, the amount of corruption, I knew there would be corruption there, but I didn't dream it was so pervasive that the entire core, C-O-R-E core of the Russian army would be rotten. Uh, but yet they're still in post and uh, could be because they're intensely loyal or because uh, President Putin, uh, and he needs an old guy like uh, Gerasimov to provide some sort of stability. Having said all that, um, I think the, uh, the logistical system of the Russian forces is exhausted, it's, it's totally broken. Um, it was not designed to do what it's having to do, um, to, to sustain long-term land operations outside of Russia. Uh, that, that requires enormous amounts of transportation and, uh, and a whole structure to help anticipate and, and deliver. And we see so many cases where they're I mean, they're going to every corner of the former Soviet Union to find ammunition. Uh, they are uh, pulling tanks that are about my age out of storage. And uh, look, the United States, we spend a ton of money on um, equipment that's put in storage to make sure that 
you can go in at, I mean, it's not like pulling rental cars off a parking lot. The things have to be in climate control facilities, make sure that the batteries are good, the seals don't dry out, all these different kind of things. That has not been happening with Russian Federation forces equipment. So, uh, and of course, the, uh, the Ukrainians have done a superb job using long range precision fires to destroy um, or at least degrade the Russian um, logistic system. Almost every other day, you can see video of a big ammunition storage site going up in smoke. Uh, and of course, that means the Russians didn't have to move ammunition further back, which means it's more difficult for the trucks. The trucks have to travel further and they've lost over a thousand trucks uh, in these six months. So, the, uh, and we're seeing the positive effect of this in a re reduction in the number of uh, artillery strikes that are happening, still terrible, but not nearly as much as it was. And then finally, the sanctions are, are damaging their logistical system as well. Uh, they cannot replace uh, precision weapons because they can no longer import the components that were needed. You know, the, the famous Iskander is about 85% non-Russian components. So they can't, they can't replace those things. Um, and then I, I have to say, finally, um, you see pitiful almost uh, videos of Russian soldiers who have been captured. I mean, they, they are not, they, they clearly are poorly led, poorly supplied, don't want to be there. Uh, they don't have the will to fight. You won't see anything by Russian troops like we saw of the Ukrainians in Mariupol, that's for sure. Um, General, you mentioned earlier that there may be uh, a num that it's hard to judge the uh, significance of American aid because we don't know the total number that we're going for. What is your estimate of either the total number that we may be trying to should be aiming for, so to say, pardon the pun, or is there or what percentage do you estimate the current what fifteen billion dollars or so uh, that's been given? What percentage of the total number do you anticipate that being? Yeah. Well, this is this is a total guess, but um, there, we're we're probably um, just a little over halfway of of what's going to be needed. Um, now, that's not just the U.S. I mean, other countries have responsibility to be able to support this as well. So, in terms of the overall um, contribution, um, because the things that are really needed now are more and more and more of these high end, uh, long range precision. Uh, rockets, uh, ballistic missile defense systems, anti-ship missiles, these, these are expensive. And um, I think the, um, I, I've, even though, the, even though the Russian army has donated uh, over a hundred really nice uh, tanks here in the last, uh, last 10 days to the Ukrainian army by abandoning them on the battlefield, uh, I think there is a need for um, Western style, like Leopard or M1 Abrams tanks, um, and all the stuff, the training that goes with that, that's expensive. So I, we're probably in the 55, 60% range of what eventually needs to be provided to win. Now, it, it's a little more complicated than that because the United States and some others are, all, are already making some investments in the long-term ability of Ukraine to defend itself. So thinking about life after the last Russian soldier leaves Crimea. Um, so that, that's, that's a cost also. And, and the United States is, in fact, there's legislation that's been put forth by Senators Shaheen and Romney uh, that would require the government to, to develop a strategy, a comprehensive strategy for the Black Sea region. You know, we always talk about Ukraine as if it's an island, but it's, it's critical because of where it sits on the map. And uh, I imagine that part of that strategy will include a much more robust U.S.-Ukraine military cooperation sort of structure you know, with long-term uh, modernization, training, and uh, advise and assist type things for Army, Navy, Air Force, Special Forces. That'll, that'll come with a big price tag also. General Hodges, wouldn't it be easier to just uh, you know accept Ukraine into NATO at that point? Hey, do it tomorrow. But right now, they're probably in the top three of re really, really good armies. Uh, they would be immediately in the top, top three of uh, really good armies uh, in NATO if, if they were to join tomorrow. 
Well, General Hodges, it's been a real pleasure and an honor to have you as a guest of Rashkin Report. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, now it's time for us to get to work uh, translating this for our audiences, Russian-speaking audiences all over the world. Um, thank you for your service and uh, uh, hope not the last time. Slava Ukraini. Hello, Slava.